Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome uh, to our lecture series on Palestine, A New Approach. I'm so honored to have um, the person who we know as the former MPAC communications director. Uh, she was our communications director in Washington, D.C. Uh, was it early 2000s? When was it? Sorry. Just, well, my start date was September 1st, 2001. Oh, my gosh. As you'll recall. Yes. Yeah. And then you were just thrown into the fire, the baptism by fire mm -hmm. uh, approach. So, uh, and you did great. Um, and then you went on to, I don't know, do so much work in academia from fellowships to getting your PhD to, um, I think you were a resident scholar at uh, Harvard School of Government or you did, you did some lecturing there, right? Well, I did my PhD at Harvard. And then I did my, um, I did have a fellowship at Harvard as well. And yeah. And uh, then you went to Evergreen. I did. College to teach there. How long were you there? I was there for six years. And now you're at Fordham. Yes. You're just starting this year or was it last year? Last year. Pandemic. Oh. Year. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah Tantawi um, is, uh, Fordham's the is part of Fordham's theology faculty. She is a specialist in contemporary Islam and Islamic law with a focus in authoritarian and post-colonial contexts. Professor El Tantawi holds a PhD from Harvard University, as we just said, in the study of religion, of Islamic studies, where she was the Jennifer W. Oppenheimer Fellow. Um, she also received her master's from Harvard in international studies on the Middle East and a bachelor's of arts from the University of California, Berkeley in rhetoric and English literature. And as soon as she left there, she joined the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I joined but, after my master's degree, actually. Oh, well. Studies, yeah. Well, uh, it seems like it was just yesterday, mm -hmm. seems, been, but it's been too long <laughs> since uh, we've seen you. So we're so glad to have you. Now, I wanted to have Sarah, um, uh, give her analysis on the nexus between anti-Palestine rhetoric and um, Islamophobia or anti-Muslim animus in the United States. You know, one example of it is th there was 9-11 and then there was a shutdown of charities. Most of the charities had to do with Palestine, even though Palestine had nothing to do with 9-11. So there's something going on there. And I wanted Sarah to give her, uh, provide her expertise uh, on that issue. So with that, I let Sarah Tantawi have the floor, have the Zoom. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Salam. It's such an honor to be here and it's great to see you again and be in, back in my home community. So um, I just, you know, I appreciate being here and I am, I've gotten glasses since we last spoke. Um, so I'm gonna give some brief comments um, about the question of Palestine and Islamophobia, but actually one of the things I want to say about it is that, as you just said, there's definitely a nexus between the question of Palestine and the development of Islamophobia in the United States. I also think that there is a significant impact of that intersection between Palestine and Islamophobia on the development of the American Muslim identity. Um, and the specifically the way that American Muslims uh, play play themselves out politically in the United States. So I'm going to actually lead up to that, and um, I'll say a few things about this, and then hopefully we can have a good discussion. We have about an hour. Is that right? Correct. Just so yeah, speak as long as you want, and then we'll we'll go into conversation and take some questions. Great. Okay. So the first thing I want to just kind of go over is a bit of history on the relationship between the question of Palestine and Islamophobia. I'm, I'm often gonna, I'm gonna kind of go from a scholarly perspective on this. So um, as Edward Said argues in his book, The Question of Palestine. So there is a tracking, so Israel advocacy groups have uh, changed their tactics of advocating for uh, in defense of Israel's actions in a manner that tracks with whatever the current kind of biases are in the United States. 
So one thing he argues is that, and you know, it seems true to me based on other research as well, and also from what I can remember, but, but and I'm curious what those of you in the audience um, remember too. Before 9-11, the main way of criticizing Palestinians was to call them Arab and tribal. It wasn't about Islam, right? It was about their Arab identity and it was about their incorrigible tribal nature. Um, there was actually a and and what that meant was that because they are so loyal to the tribe um that they necessarily had a kind of forked tongue and they could not um negotiate in good faith uh they say one thing to amongst themselves and uh, other things to the outside of the tribe this was the rhetoric before 9 11. in fact there was also much commentary on the arabic language itself this is something i always found interesting that the Fusha, the classical Arabic, is just so florid and so complicated that it lends itself to kind of um, rhetoric and, and lack of clarity. And um, it's just embedded in the language, you know, so it was really all about Arabness <clears throat> as the problem. And then suddenly, um, as Said argues, after 9-11, that script got pretty much scrapped and it became about the problem is Islam. So, um, you know, and of course, this matched the, the, the national mood after 9-11. Um, and so, you know, the, the overarching theme uh, always is to show that Palestinians, Muslims, Arabs are fundamentally different than us. Um, and so whatever way accomplishes that goal is sort of what we have seen. Uh, a case in point, I remember some years ago, and I probably when I was at MPAC, um, Re Representative Tom Lantos of California, there was a big scandal because he cited the Treaty of Hudabeya um, from the Prophet's time. In, in his interpretation of it was that the Muslims went back on, an, uh, on a treaty that was signed by with the Jewish tribe. Um, so this would have been the seventh century. And as a result, this is being argued in the US Congress, as a result of this, it is impossible for Muslims to negotiate fairly with Jews. Um, and of course, you know, as I just said before it was, well, the Arabs can't negotiate because of their tribal culture and the Arabic language. And now it's about Islam and its history and culture. So you see that again, another overarching theme though, between the two is this, this idea of dual loyalties, you know, that um, you can't really trust what they say, be it Arabs or Muslims. Another point that we know about the kind of advocacy landscape is that um, there was a, 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 a report that was leaked by a pollster Frank Luntz, who's a quite a well-known Republican pollster. And um, he was commissioned to write a communication strategy for um, some lobbying, you know, lobbying groups for Israel's interests. And basically, again, the, the, the main recommendation there was at every turn, frame the pro-Israel perspective as like Americans and frame the, the Palestinian perspective as foreign. And there were, you know, really interesting details like at any possible turn in the media, of course, have spokespeople who don't have accents, who appear to be American. There are specific suggestions about what sports teams to reference. So, you know, right there, I would have been out of luck completely if I followed that, but like Yankees, Mets, whatever, you know, um, make sure to, to, you know, throw in features of American culture and pop culture whenever possible. Um, and especially to emphasize the issue of women's rights and LGBTQ rights as uh, two areas that, you know, Israel's like Americans and the Palestinians are hopelessly retrograde and, um, and dangerous, right? Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, academic literature now on the, specifically on the LGBTQ issue on what's called pinkwashing. So the idea that um, in a sense, because Israel has a better record with LGBTQ issues, which is undeniable. Um, but because they have that better record, it, it somehow frames the Palestinians as 
barbaric and really the implication of that is like deserving of punishment. Okay, so these are complicated issues that uh, I'll touch on a bit more actually in a second. So all of this aligned perfectly with the kind of metastasizing Islamophobia that took root in this country after 9-11. And then the Islamophobia discourse also took on a life of its own. So first the discourse centered around why don't the moderates speak out? That was the big thing. Uh, is that still, must still be a thing. It, as it develops, I don't think that the, the old, that the old talking points go away. I think you just add to them. So, right. okay, so you, you agree with that? Okay, so yeah. So why don't the moderates speak out? Um, while also, and I, I know this personally, you know, excluding Muslims who did speak out um, and thus implying that there were actually no so-called moderates. I would say that's changed a bit and I'll get to that. Um, so of course I say so-called with the question of what is a moderate because of going back to Palestine, it kind of always goes back to Palestine, interestingly, um, because every effort was made to define moderate as, you know, these kind of ephemeral pro-Israel Muslims, you know, and so if you weren't, and what does pro-Israel mean? It kind of means, um, in a sense, it means in this context, it kind of meant sublimating all of your moral outrage about what was happening to the Palestinians. So if you were to, if you had a, a, any kind of response to the wars on Gaza or to the blockades or to home demolitions, that's not being a moderate Muslim, right? So it, it's, it, it really got, um, you know, quite unfair, right, in that sense, because it's really asking people to tamp down on what should be kind of a natural moral response. Then the discourse um, developed in, it became about, and yeah, again, it's adding on it became about creeping Sharia and incompatible legal systems or the danger of incompatible legal systems. So the idea that Islam itself is nothing but a legal code. Um, I'll reference a book in a moment by Asma Uddin called When Islam is Not a Religion. And so that, you know, that became a really big feature of the Islamophobia industry, this idea of making Islam into a political structure, not a religion, and in fact, only a legal code. A legal code that all Muslims want to implement and a legal code that is codified. It's set in stone, it's written on a piece of parchment, which is not true. Um, and, um, and then, you know, all Muslims have a secret agenda to eventually see that be the law of the land wherever they are. I'll come back to that because I do think we have some issues with the Muslim community in this, in, with the lack of coherence on this. So I'm gonna talk about that. But first, just a little more detail on the Islamophobia industry. So um, just to go into detail on it, the Islamophobia industry is a, a million, a multi-million dollar enterprise that is aimed at demonizing Islam Muslims and Muslim practice in the United States. To give a snapshot, the largest funder of the Islamophobia industry is called the Donors Capital Fund and Donors Trust, which is a 501c3, 509a3 organization supporting Donors Trust, a public charity and donor advised fund formed to safeguard the charitable interest of donors who are dedicated to the ideals of limited government, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. So what does that have to do with Islam? Um, according to Fear Incorporated, which is a project of the Center for American Progress, which charts the Islamophobia industry, the donor capital fund is most famous for contributing more than $17 million in 2008 to the Clarion Project. So it all kind of funnels down and it's hard to trace exactly where the money is coming from. Um, formerly the Clarion Fund and the largest recipient of donors capital's largesse. Indeed, donors capital funds contributions make up 96% of all of the funding of Clarion Project received that year. The $17 million provided by a single anonymous source helped pay for a DVD that Clarion distributed called, quote, Obsession, Radical Islam's War Against the West, which was then sent to more than 28 million swing voters before the 2008 presidential election. 
Donors Trust started contributing to the Islamophobia Network in 2005 and has contributed 353,000 between 2005 and 2012. In total, Donors Capital Fund and Donors Trust have contributed $27,042,600 between 2005 and 2012 to groups promoting Islamophobia. The Donors Capital Fund, as of 2011, gave the Middle East Forum, which is an organi organization founded by probably one of the most notorious Islamophobes um, by the name of Daniel Pipes, $12,593,000 $12,593,745. Uh, that's a lot of money. According to Fear Incorporated, the Middle East Forum is a conservative think tank founded by Daniel Pipes in 1990. According to the organization's website, its mission is to promote American interests in the Middle East and protect Western values from Middle Eastern threats. The forum has had more than 4.6 million in revenue from 2012. It relies upon its publication, the Middle East Quarterly, and a network of monitoring programs, including Campus Watch, which as an academic, we're all aware of. This uh, this is a website in which you can find yourself on it uh, for you know, always with misquotes and, and such uh, for bad speech regarding Israel, according to them. Islamist Watch, um, another blacklist site, and the legal project to include fears of militant Islam and to monitor people and organizations whose views contradict Pipes. This organization echoes the alarmist rhetoric of Daniel Pipes by branding Muslim Sharia and even the instruction of Arabic as affronts to American freedom. The Middle East Forum is at the center of the Islamophobia network. It has received more than 12 million in funding from donors in the network since 2001. And in turn, it has donated funds to organizations featured in the Islamophobia Network, including Zufti Jasser's American Islamic Forum for Democracy, Frank Gaffney's Center for Security Policy, Robert Spencer's Jihad Watch, and Steve Emerson's Investigative Project on Terrorism. From 2009 to 2012, the highest recipients of MEF funding have been the Investigative Project of Terrorism, 1,409,000, Center for Security Policy, 260,000. Okay, I gave you a lot of details just to uh, show you a little bit how this works. It's actually much more vast than this. And again, if you're interested, you can look at the Center for American Progress's website. Uh, the, it's called Fear Incorporated, and they do an amazing job tracking the funding. The Islamophobia, and so it's too elaborate, uh, it's too vast to elaborate in detail, but it sponsors a network of spokespeople in the media and independent think tanks and organizations. And there are these agreed upon talking points that assert that Islam is a threat to the United States that all Muslims want to impose Sharia, and that Islam is the impetus for Middle Eastern terrorism, especially in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's also a change that happened after 9-11. It used to be Arab-Israeli, now it's Palestinian-Israeli. Or now, I don't know what it, now it's maybe post-Trump, it's something else. Um, the rhetoric of the industry frames the struggle with Islam as a civilizational one with Judeo-Christian civilization on one side and the threat of Islamdom on the other. So uh, in just one example, Nathan Lean in his book, The Islamophobia Industry, reports on how Bill Keller, who's a Florida-based internet evangelical, evangel evangelical person, um, put the problem, echoing, according to Lean, Osama bin Laden, quote, the battle lines will be soon be drawn on the lines of faith. The US, which is seen worldwide as representing Christianity, along with Israel, is against Islam. Ultimately, this will change from being a war on terrorism to a holy war. One of the most striking manifestations of the Islamophobia industry is the series of preemptive attacks, in quotes, against Sharia in the United States. According to Asma uh, Uddin in her book, When Islam is Not a Religion, there are three categories of anti-Sharia laws. The first single out Sharia specifically and describe it as anti-American. The second also mentions Sharia, but includes other, includes other legal systems such as canon law and halakha, Jewish law. The third and most common type advocates against any kind of foreign law while not mentioning Sharia specifically. As an example, Udin reports on a media interview with Republican Rex Duncan of Oklahoma who introduced an anti-Sharia bill in his state. 
in response to the interviewers incredulity that there was any danger to that Oklahoma would be taken over by Sharia law, Duncan replied, quote, this is a preemptive strike to make sure that liberal judges don't take the bench in an effort to use their position to undermine those founding principles and to consider international law or Sharia law. One thing I find interesting here, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, is that here there's a conflation of conservative principles and this fear of liberal judges, the sphere of international law, the globalists, that's how the rhetoric grew with Trump, the international order. Interestingly enough, Islam, the fear of Islam, which is normally coded as this barbaric medieval Sharia system, is actually now put in the basket of the globalist, internationalist, liberal order. So that's actually the strange place we're in now. Um, and I'll elaborate on that in a second, but that it reminded me of that. <clears throat> so um, Nadia Mazruki in her book, Islam and American Religion, describes the Sharia panic this way. She says, at the base of the anti-Sharia project, one finds not so much a moral or religious vision, but rather a set of defensive postures around a certain imagined conception of politics that combines constitutional populism, anti-elitism, originalism, i.e. legal literalism that believes the constitution can and must be strictly interpreted the way it was first intended at the time of its ratification, and a binary approach to the world founded on the distinction between friends and enemies. So it is inevitable that this insistence on a friend enemy distinction results in a defensive posture for Muslim representatives in the public sphere. The sheer scale uh, of the Islamophobia industry has created a state of affairs whereby simply stating that one is a Muslim can be an act of resistance. Because of this sustained attack on an abstract fantastical conception of Sharia, Muslim advocates in the political realm are caught in this always defensive posture. Now, my theory on this um, is that this backdrop of Islamophobia within which the struggle over Palestine has always been at the center has led um, to a, a big bifurcation now in American Muslim identity. And I think of these as the expansionist camp versus the orthodox camp. So one of the points I want to make is that Palestine is at the center of the Islamophobia industry in many ways in the modern period. I mean, I, you know, at one point I taught a class on Islamophobia and to actually do this correctly, you really do have to go back to the Crusades. It's kind of not fair to pin the entire Islamophobia is not only about the Israel Palestine conflict, because as we know, that's a new conflict, right? Um, and it's often framed as being ancient and old, but that's actually part of the talking points that are not true. It's not ancient and old. So Islamophobia is a much older phenomena, but um, in our contemporary moment, yes, you know, the question of, especially in the United States, it's different in Europe, but in the United States, especially the question of Palestine is at the center. So um, it's at the center and it's created this major industry and then that pressure that Muslims are always under, uh, Muslim spokespeople and regular Muslims, has actually shaped Muslim identity. I mean, it has had a prof this whole nexus that we're discussing has had a profound effect on American Muslims and how they define themselves and who they are. And I've been thinking about this in an academic context. And as I just said, I think that it has really pushed Muslims into um, either the what I'm calling the expansionist camp, which I'll explain, or the orthodox camp. So the expansionists are people who um, sometimes called progressives, but I see the progressives as under the umbrella of expansionists. Um, they emerged mainly after 9-11. And the idea here is that we need to push the boundaries of Islamic theology and law and practice um, as wide open as possible. Um, sometimes to the point where it's hard to see what's specifically Islamic about that point of view, right? Because um, sometimes when I read 
the bylaws of organizations that that I would put under the expansionist camp. I mean, if you took out the word Islam, I could be reading the ACLU uh, bylaws or some any other liberal American organization. So um, it's a really, really wide net and a very wide interpretation. And there's my point is that there's very little focus on actual Islamic law and theology. And that has been replaced along with so much else in current American culture with a kind of identity politics. So now it's just about, I just have to look Muslim. I just have to wear a certain thing or look a certain way or say certain words, uh, claim certain words, claim the identity and that's enough. You know, and so it's, a, it's an interestingly hollowed out kind of um, perspective. Now the Orthodox camp, I need to be fair to the expansionists because both of these camps are, are reacting against each other. The Orthodox camp, so on one hand, they're reacting to these progressives or the expansionists and saying, hey, you're hollowing out the religion. You're not being serious about what it actually says. So then they in turn double down and engage in their own form of reductionism and identity politics by saying, no, Islam is one, two, three, and four. Islamic law is X, Y, and Z, and you can't go outside of that. Um, and so they're drawing these kind of really strict boundaries. And in many ways, it's in reaction to the expansionists. It must be fairly, to be fair, it must be said that the expansionists are often operating in reaction to the Orthodox, who they see as way too rigid, patriarchal, um, unmoving, and unable to adapt to American culture. So how does this relate to Palestine? Well, um, so I would like, I mean, to give my own perspective as someone who's been active on this issue um, for a long time and on American Muslim issues, I think we're in a very rapidly changing moment right now with regard to how Palestine is understood um, and interpolated into our media landscape. I remember, I often say this, I remember, and I still insist that I'm not that old. So even as late as when I was in college, I remember that even the word Palestine was a taboo. I mean, certainly when I was in grade school, you could not say the word Palestine, um, right. you know? And uh, I mean, really, right? You'd get all this like social punishment and it is really like scary, but that is not the case anymore at all. And in fact, we're in this extremely interesting moment where, um, I mean, there's no other way I can say it, like Palestine in some corners is almost a woke issue, uh, if I may use that phrase. And so now we're gonna really have to uh, like figure out what to do with that because that is very, very different. And so for those of us who don't know what that means, um, you know, that's, how do you describe woke? Um, you know what it is like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's part of the progressive, it's look, it's still hard to get, none of this corresponds to actual justice for Palestinians, by the way. So if anything, yeah. it's just getting worse, right? But in terms of the discourse here in the United States, I mean, it is part of the like- It's a litmus test. Progressive platform. Yeah, there, there, yeah it is a, a bit of a litmus test, yes, at this point, which is, that just happened really rapidly, so I can hardly believe it. But yeah, you do have to have a certain kind of position on Palestine and LGBTQ issues and trans issues. And the, you know, so Palestine's on that list now. And that's like within the last like what two years or something. I mean, I think that's really very recent, recent right? So, so then you know what? What do we do with that? And what kinds of questions and issues does that raise? And so the reason I went into that whole thing about the expansionist and orthodox camp is because I do think it's raising new issues and that actually also comes back onto the Islamophobia problem. Um, so I'm thinking, for example, of someone like Linda Sarsour, who is a very prominent Palestinian spokesperson, um, part, wears hijab, looks Muslim, um, and you know, with much respect to her, I mean, she's attacked you know every day. So I'm not trying to get on that boat at all, but I'm using her as an academic example. Um, but part of that, the you know, woke movement, right? 
Okay, so part of that will, and hey, I think that's not bad at all because we need it. I mean, it's better than the total taboo, right? So, but so one, I, I'm thinking of like several kinds of pieces of hot water that she's gotten in, for example, because, um, for example, uh, she's she's attacked often on Twitter regarding, you know, she goes to these rallies, she's representing Islam and the Palestinian cause as kind of one cause. See, that's one thing because they're both now identities, like it's this identity thing. And, but then like, because it's a woke issue, she's on the stage with trans activists and LGBTQ activists. So then the Orthodox come back and say, what are you doing? Like, how could you represent us this way? And so there's this real, these real fault lines that are being created um, in the American Muslim community right now around just like, what is Islam? Um, because of the info, because we're so influenced by the, the politics and the Islamophobia, it's everything. It's, it's really kind of hollowing out practice in many ways, or if you're orthodox, or if you're a quietist, person who doesn't want to get involved in politics, then it's it's actually pushing people even more to the like right, if you will, or to the more orthodox perspective. Another example I can think of with Linda Sarsour is um, she was asked to define Sharia. And her answer was Sharia is what Muslims define it as. So now we're in this identity politics issue again, because I could just and then what's a Muslim? So, I mean, if I wore hijab and I said, you know, Sharia is X, Y, Z, you know, actually Sharia, you know, from a scholarly perspective or from an Islamic, it's, it's Sharia. First of all, it is an idealization. It doesn't actually exist. I mean, and if you're talking about Islamic law, you're actually talking about fiqh, and then you need to go into the details on that. And mm -hmm. so I actually, to be very fair, I find this very problematic because I think that there, you know, I just went off for half an hour about Islamophobia industry and how I'm against it. So do not get me wrong, but to not have a coherent way of talking about what is Sharia and how does it influence, you know, how would it interact with the American legal system? And what are the implications of that? I mean, these are conversations that, that Jewish communities and intellectuals have had to have in a very serious way concerning Jewish law. Right. And so this is something it's just not good enough to say, well, it's whatever Muslims defined it as that might work for Twitter, but it doesn't work for real life. And we don't have an actual coherent answer on that. And there's to bring it back to Palestine. There's a couple of reasons I'm very concerned about this. Number one, we still have a major problem. I think our biggest problem in terms of justice for Palestine is in, in the Western context is probably Christian Zionism, right, where you have millions of people who think that um, who are being told week after week after week that Jesus will not return unless the Holy Land is returned to the Jewish people and that the Muslims are the enemy. This is, you know, week after week, people are being told this relentlessly. And this is very, very powerful. And so, of course, there are critiques of that movement from other Christian movements, from other from everyone else, right? But again, it's, it's if we can't be coherent, because let me say something else. It's very hard for us. Another place we're falling short is with respect to political Islam in general in the region, which is also really kind of now shaken in a fault line. So Hamas, you know, how is Hamas different? Now, how is Hamas different in terms of some kind of idea of religion and politics, to put it very generally, how is that different than the Christian Zionists that we're complaining against, right? How, how can we be coherent on these? We need to be more coherent about that because one of the other issues that we um, are having problem articulating is like, well, what is our vision? And of course, as a non-Palestinian, I kind of consider this none of my business, but at the same time, it would be great to have a coherent, um, way of talking about what our vision of final status, the final status solution is. And obviously that final status solution has to include Jews. And what and so um, what's, what's the vision? 
what does the state look like? What, what kind of laws are we talking about? And so I find it difficult to, to really coherently talk about the Christian Zionist um, challenge, which is re really the way that you would critique that is to say, hey, we don't want these kinds of religious um, apocalyptic ideas in politics. Well, if that's the case there, then that needs to be the case on the Islamic side, right? So that's one thing. Um, and then, you know, I'll just end on that note by saying that, yeah, the, the, the fact that there's this incoherence with political Islam in general is really becoming problematic. We just saw another revolt. I would call it a revolt against Islamism again in Tunisia that just happened recently. Um, I just saw in Al Jazeera that um, Hamas had congratulated the Taliban on the, the end of the American occupation and the takeover. So we've got some things to work out um, and get a little more clear about. So I'm not, you know, I'm being, I'm trying to be as fair as possible and not mince words. Uh, and so now I hope that I've created enough fodder for discussion. Oh, you've definitely created a lot and I appreciate it. No, I, number one, thank you. I think, you know, your navigation of the Islamophobia industry and its connection to Palestine, I think it's, it was uh, lucid um and um it's very very helpful in terms of how we can um um uh, develop a, a, a better strategy in terms of addressing that and as you as you said uh you know later on there are some internal issues for us to address um uh so uh we we can get to that a, as well um but i i wanted to uh, go back to um, this industry, um, and um, and and you know you you said that there was a switch from uh, you know uh, looking at uh, Palestine as Arab and tribal to looking at Palestine as a problem with Islam. Yeah. Um, and, and and so everything that was um, then 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 written about and critiqued as it relates to Palestine turned into an Islamic problem. Mm -hmm. Now, should we as American Muslims then, uh, how do we counter that? Do we counter that by saying, no, that's not the real Islam, or do we counter that by uh, looking at, at this exploitation in and of itself? <clears throat> it's a tough one because part of the conflation is happening on the Muslim side, right? That that um, we're putting together the concept of Islam and the Palestinian issue as well, for obvious reasons, because, you know, again, as an immigrant community, largely, but um, there was a need to, you know, the Muslim identity became everything, especially for the majority immigrant community. So, it's like the organizations like the Muslim Public Affairs Council handle everything from Palestine to civil rights issues, to prayer, to, right, to, to um, creedal issues. So um, I do think that as the community evolves and gains sophistication, it is important to start separating these things more and to get a little bit more focused on what exactly do we mean by Islam as a religion, as a creed, um, and and separate that somewhat from the politics, I would say. Well, let's look into the issue of the Sharia, as, as you mentioned. And you, you worked on this issue um, as it relates to Nigeria, yeah. where uh, you, you know it mentioned that people actually came out in, in protest streets to bring Sharia. Yeah. Why is that? If, if, if it's such a bad thing, uh, why is it that people want to embrace it so so dearly? Great question. Um, so, in I wrote a book called Sharia on Trial: Northern Nigeria's Islamic Revolution, and as Salam just said, it looks at why it is that Nigerians went out into the streets and demanded the reimplementation of Sharia law. And in my work, I actually make a distinction between idealized Sharia and political Sharia. And what I found was that when people go out and ask for Sharia, they are projecting um, their idealizations of what they associate Islam with justice 
And so they are projecting their own idealizations onto the concept of Sharia. Because Sharia itself, even in Islam, is an idealization. So um, meaning that the Sharia is God's perfect law and all human beings can do is attempt to uh, figure out what God's perfect law is. So in the Nigerian case, what people actually wanted was an end to poverty and corruption. And so what you end up doing is you emphasize aspects of the Sharia that will bring you the solutions to these problems. So in this case, it was Zakat, or uh, it was stories of the Caliph Omar who threatened to cut off the hand of his own daughter if she had committed crimes of, of, of theft because there was so much corruption in government. So the answer to the question is, why do they want it? Because they associate Islam very sincerely and in terms of lived experience with justice. Now, a lot of the time though, and I, I you know, we've been having so many discussions about Afghanistan. It, again, there's a difference between Sharia and fiqh. So when people say, well, God's law, this happens all over the Muslim majority world. Of course we want Sharia, of course. And this is why all these polls that come out, pupils that say, oh, 99% of Muslims want Sharia. And then it gets all you know plastered on the front page of the New York Times. Oh, 99% of Muslims want stonings and hand amputation. No, what people mean when they say Sharia is about what they think of Islam. And so many Muslims, they don't even know what a medhab is, let alone what their medhab is or what fiqh is or what these 13th century legal texts say about X, Y, and Z issue. So that, that's, the, that's the problem. There's like an issue of translation there. Um, and then, you know, let's get into the Islamophobia industry. You talked about the Donors Capital Fund, the Donors Trust that funded $17 million to Clarion. Um, that uh, produced that uh, DVD obsession, which is distributed to 28 million households. I think in the Sunday newspaper, you know, you get like you get your your sample uh, of detergent uh, on Sundays. You instead of that, you got a sample DVD from uh, wow. from them uh, in your Sunday paper uh, that was uh, dropped uh, on battleground states during the 2008 election. It didn't work. But uh, they, it, it was a major effort, uh, and it definitely, um, you know, uh, impacted uh, the image of, of Muslims um, uh, in a detrimental manner. Where where do you see these movements today, uh, including Campus Watch and including, uh, you know, Steve Emerson's uh, outfit and, and and groups like that, in terms of their funding, in terms of their efficacy. I would ask you that um, a little more, but in, in my corner of the world in academia, I think it's known now that um, these blacklist sites are pretty mean, meaningless, um, but they do also target students, which is really um, unfortunate, you know, attempting to kind of smear them. Um, it's, it's interesting because I would say in the Trump era, things have gotten so muddled um, in terms of there's just so much more, there was so much more vitriol introduced into public discourse that it's my perception is that those got a little more drowned out by everything else. But actually I would ask you that from your perspective too. I mean, from my standpoint, it, it seems quiet, but I don't know if it's the quiet before the storm or um, you know, did the Trump era really damage this group because they 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 really latched on to a lot of these uh, right wing groups. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, 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 but it was interesting to hear your perspective on that as well. That mm -hmm. you know, in terms of academia, it seems like it's also kind of gotten a little quiet on that front. A little more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right, and then you know, in terms of counterterrorism, and then I ask uh, you know our 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 guests if you want to ask a question, go ahead and put it in the Q and A box or in the chat box, and please, please let's just ask questions uh, and and be constructive. I know Carl, you have very strong views, and uh, quite frankly, you know we're very tolerant uh, as as an American Muslim organization, 
And it's great. Uh, I think it's a great sign to see that we uh, allow people to come and say, hey, you guys uh, are full of nonsense. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we, we allow that in our, in, our, uh, in our discussions and we allow you to ask any question, but please, Carl, just uh, if you can ask a question uh, if you're gonna put anything in the chat box. Um, in terms of the counterterrorism industry, I just wanted to ask you, you know, we, we, we're we just did this paper uh, on the double standards between domestic terrorism designation and foreign terrorism designation. Mm. If you're white and you're being investigated as a white supremacist, you're put under the domestic terrorism. Mm. And there are civil rights protections there. I mean, mm. you, you know, there's not gonna be FISA uh, court uh, <laughs> allowance of surveillance. Sorry, that's the dog. Um, in the background, um, and and <clears throat> you're not going to get your assets seized and and things like that. Your your community is not stigmatized. Whereas foreign terrorist designation, that you know everything is is fair game, yeah. um, and it, it includes stigmatizing a whole community. So um, uh, yeah, that the, the issue of Palestine obviously comes in because if you're if you're supporting Palestine, then that that narrative is, well, maybe you're part of a terrorist group. You're, you're part of an extremist group. Because mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're critical of Israel, uh, then, then you're not, uh, you, you know, it, then, then maybe you have this propensity for, uh, for extremism. Um, so we, we see that in the, in the counterterrorism industry and that all comes down to, you know, this, this prosecution of the war on terror. So if you can, you know, from and, and you lived it. I mean, you were there, uh, as you said. You started working for MPAC September one, two thousand one. So it only took ten days for you to, to see the whole world change, and then you were right in the midst of it in Washington D.C. This war on terror, um, and and how Palestine really became a part of the war on terror, as as we said uh, earlier, with the seizure of assets of, of charities doing work for Palestine. Um, so in terms of the counterterrorism industry, do you, you know, how, how do you see that playing out um, as it relates to Islamophobia in, in terms of, you know, the, the anti-Muslim animus that is used to drive this foreign terrorist policy designation? Hmm. Well, I see it as a piece of the need to keep creating Islam and Muslims as an enemy. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, for example, with the Iraq war, if you'll remember Condoleezza Rice saying that the road to Baghdad is through Jerusalem, right? So it's, um, it, again, it's another example of getting certain agendas met with regard to the Arab-Israeli issue vis-a-vis um, -vis Islamophobia and demonizing Muslims. So, um, I mean, we there, it's it's a multifaceted problem because there's the question of how you define terrorism. There's the question of the geopolitical inequities that create terrorism. There's the issue of power disparities that create terrorism. And there's the issue of extremism as well on the Muslim side, um, in some cases that create these types of interpretations that lead to terrorism. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just, we don't have a, a calm and multifaceted and fair enough logical analysis of the problem. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't. I, I, think when we talk about the war on terror, it's, it's becoming, it is becoming more nebulous and amorphous, uh, and, um, and, 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 you know, with, with what happened in, in Afghanistan, you, you wonder, well, okay, there, there's, there's obviously a major flaw in the policy, and yet I don't see any, anyone saying, hey, let's now review the policy in the war on terror. It, it is still status quo. Right. It's still status quo, and I think I think it's up to us to get people to, um, to get uh, to to instigate a debate uh, on that issue. Okay, Carl asks a question: What are American Muslim groups like Care, uh, MPAC, and others saying about Taliban victory? Well, 
we're we're all saying that the Taliban uh, does not represent Islam, uh, Carl. I mean, there, nobody is, oh, it, it, nobody is, nobody's like uh, going out and celebrating this. Uh, in fact, we're doing the opposite. We are agonizing over uh, what's happened to the Afghan people, uh, the refugee crisis that uh, is a result of it, the number of Afghan, the millions of Afghans who are stuck in that country now, having to deal with the with the Taliban, uh, and um, nobody is celebrating uh, the the Taliban here. What Hamas does, you, you can deal with Hamas. We don't we don't speak for Hamas. We we don't care to. Uh, associate with with Hamas, uh, but uh, you know. I will not bother Carl with my poor speaking skills, so we can move on. <laughs> All right, D, uh, Hadab asks, uh, do you think Islamophobia is hurting the plight of the Palestinians, especially with the rise of Hamas, or is it the other way around that the issue of Palestine is used to promote Islamophobia? Hmm. Do you think Islamophobia is hurting the plight of Palestinians, especially with the rise of Hamas? So, Hadeb, does that mean, basically, are you asking, do you think Hamas is hurting the cause of Palestine? Is that, can I understand you as saying that in the first part? Or is it the other way around that the issue of Palestine is used to promote Islamophobia? Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm make an exception. I'm going to allow Hadeb to talk. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Salam, for the, thank you, Salam, for the exception. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and uh, thank you, Sara, for a, a, a great perspective. I really appreciate it. Good to see you again. Um, and yes, my, my question was um, mm -hmm. basically with, with the rise of Hamas, um, and of course, it is always used uh, against the Palestinians' plight uh, for their freedom and justice. But do you think it is used to promote Islamophobia. Be, the fact that Hamas is a religious a religious group, uh, then it is used to prom, uh, you know to promote Islamophobia here in the West. Yes, it's used to promote Islamophobia because the way that Hamas is talked about is often um, not factual. Like for example, there's all of these um, references to the Hamas Charter, which was changed you know over ten years ago and. There's certain aspects of it that are just not, they're, they're kind of represented in a hysterical way designed to promote his, his Islamophobia. On the other hand, at, like, I just have to say, as somebody who studies political Islam and who studies the region, I just think a separate conversation has to be had about um, political Islam, what it means, do we want it running states, um, how do the people of Gaza feel about Hamas's governance? But I agree with you; those are those are kind of two separate issues. Because I mean, it's it's a question of good faith versus bad faith. If you want freedom and justice for Palestinians, within that context, to have some critical commentary about Hamas is one thing. If your agenda is to completely change the subject away from the plight of the Palestinians, from the occupation, from the home demolitions and then just focus on this kind of red herring, then yes, um, it, it, it becomes a distraction. But is Hamas criticizable? Absolutely. But can it be used in a way to distract us from the bigger picture? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Salam. Um, and just a quick final note, only because I really see when we're talking about, um, you know, the, the whole rhetoric about, you know, the Palestinian, you know, Palestinian plight, and Islamophobia, I feel that that whole discussion eliminates the existence of the Palestinian Christians oh, and yeah. their their part of the of the struggle and their part their their voice in this whole thing. It's almost like you know is is trying to totally uh, you know sideline them and, and eliminate them from the equation, and that to me is problematic. That's a very good point. Actually, I was I had that written down to talk about, and you're absolutely right that part of the yeah, part of the, I talked about the, it's it's the fault of the Arabs, it's the fault of the Muslims, and then when it got to it's the fault of the Muslims, suddenly the Palestinian Christians, up to 20% of the population, completely disappeared from the story. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Great point. Um, uh, Carl asks, uh, actually, a very interesting question. Uh, you speak of political Islam. Is there such a thing as non-political Islam? Yes. And what is that? 
Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure he's asking that in good faith, but I'll go ahead and answer yeah, it. I mean, we'll, 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 we'll answer so, it. Not political Islam. I mean, I actually think that that's what, in a good faith way of asking that question. I do think that there, you know, since the end of colonialism at the turn of the 20th century, it's true that there has been a, a rise of political Islam as kind of, as, and Salafism as our, I would argue right now, one of our main forms of Islam in the world. Um, and so, um, and arguably from the beginning of Islamic history, it does have a political component. I think that that's actually undeniable, but that's not the kind of social reality of Muslims for 15 centuries. So the answer to the question, is there a non-political Islam? Yeah, that's the Islam that the vast majority of people practice is a personal and non-political form of Islam. Um, there's also, we could talk about Sufism, which is you know mystical tradition, which again, up until modernity was not separate at all from orthodox, what we would now think of as orthodox or legally oriented Islam. So, um, and that's the mystical tradition does not have um, generally a political component. I mean, obviously, see, the thing is, it's a historical question too, because before the rise of the nation state, Islam was operative within empires and it was always necessary to have political um, dealings with leadership. So it, it's, there's a theological answer. Yes, in a sense that there's a historical answer, which is yes, Islam has always intersected with politics until the rise of the secular nation state because we didn't even have a concept of a secular citizen before you know, recent centuries. Um, but I think the way that Carl perhaps is answering it is in that kind of sense that Asma Uddin writes about where it's like the argument is trying to be made that Islam is not a religion, it's nothing but a political ideology. And that's just very simplistic. Yeah. No, I th and I think you have to separate political Islam from, uh, uh, from this notion of politics as a part of life. I mean, politics is part of every religious group. There are Christian groups, Jewish groups that engage in politics here in the United States. We don't call them political Judaism or political Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we talk about these uh, political Islam, we're really talking about religious nationalists. And there are mm -hmm. Christian nationalists, Jewish nationalists, and Muslim nationalists. And this idea of nationalism is using religion as a vehicle for power and, um, and, then, and then using nationalism as a way of catapulting yourself onto the, uh, onto the arena and the platform. Yeah. And it's very localized. It's, it's, it, it is ideological. Mm -hmm. it, it is imposing uh, on, on others. So that's a very unique uh, form uh, of a usurpation of, of religion. Uh, dealing with politics, like we all do, you know, because we go to the Congress and, and say we want justice, does that mean that we're part of political Islam? No, <laughs> we're, part of, we're part of every group that has the right to petition our government. And, and, and as you said, a lot of the Muslims are, are, are actually part of this, this civilian population that are in opposition to whatever the government is doing. And if it's an Islamic government, you have Muslims in Iran who are opposed to what the Iranian government are doing. Mm -hmm. you, you have Muslims, I'm sure, in Afghanistan now who, who are gonna be opposing uh, what the Taliban is going to be doing. They're not, they're not, you don't call that political Islam, but they're part of the, right. the people. They're part of the, the opposition. Carl makes reference here to Yusuf Al-Qaradawi. I mean, so he called him the great Islamic religious authority. So that's not true. Right, that's not true. Islamic religious authority. He's yeah. a, you know, he's a spokesperson of basically the Muslim Brotherhood in Qatar. And that's a particular ideology. You know, that is, that's what I was talking about with the political Islam movements at the end of colonialism, the beginning of the 20th century that went and really reasserted Islam as an identity and as a political identity vis-a-vis -vis the nation state. That's a very particular strain. I happen to be of the opinion that that strain has become um, 
too many people conflate that strain with Islam itself. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I think it's marriage with Salafism and the, the fact that Salafi Wahhabism in particular is so well-funded. Um, and there are a lot of other geopolitical reasons that um, that is kind of a very dominant form of Islam, but it is a strain that we can historicize and look at in a particular context. It's not the very essence and definition of Islam. Um, we are actually at the time, so I'm going to ask one last question, or if you want to have a closing comment uh, uh, at this point. Uh, but I'd like you to talk uh, a little bit about you know, this idea of how this impacts the American Muslim identity. Yeah. And I think you touched upon it in terms of coherence on certain issues. I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that or if, if you wanted to add to that. I mean, I'm really just seeing a need for, it's clear that we have what I call the expansionist camp, which are the, the people who might be a majority who, I don't know, Salam, you're closer to the to the pulse than I am at this point, but, mm -hmm. but um, I do, I would guess that the majority, again, what is a Muslim? Because these pupils, they get us in trouble because it, is a Muslim a person who goes to the mosque every week? Is a Muslim a person that calls himself a Muslim? What is, what's the definition? But if a Muslim, if we have the broadest possible definition of Muslim as someone who identifies as a Muslim, I, I would venture to guess that, you know, somewhere hovering above 51% would be more in the expansionist camp in the United States, wanting to see a broader interpretation, wanting to, um, of, of the creed and of the possibilities of full citizenship in our kind of liberal American order, okay? Um, but the problem there, as I tried to point out, is that it does kind of hollow out Islam itself as a religion, which is not politics. It's, it's actually a, it's a faith, it's a mystical tradition, it's a relationship to the divine, it's, it's a lot of things, right, that's developed over all of this time. And so I have a critique of identity politics in general as being a bit reductionist, and I personally worry that that could happen to the to the Islamic tradition if this is what it becomes, just like another identity to wear. And another challenge I see there is that you have this pretty vociferous Orthodox camp that's upset about what's going on with the expansionists and really doubling down and creating stricter boundaries and borders around what it means to be Muslim. And actually calcifying and solidifying a legal tradition that should be more open and interpretable. So the one solution I see to this problem is that we really need to be developing schools of thought, um, institutions, seminaries that actually take the theology more seriously from an expansionist point of view. That really needs to be like the wave of the day. Yeah, and there are so many problems to that. And I know we're over time, but this is an important topic. So we're gonna extend and I know it's late over there so sorry about that Sarah Sarah but, uh, um, you know I you know, part, part of the problem is there's theological silence on these issues I think as you alluded to mm -hmm. uh, by many of our um, as you named them or orthodox uh, camp um, th there there's just no clarification there's no discourse it, you know it it's it's something that they you know traditionalists tend to be that way uh, also that they they don't want to comment on things that are outside what the scholars have already constructed. If it's outside that realm, hey, we're not supposed to talk about. It. We're only talking about here's the here's the, the the dalil, if you will. Here's the you know the order uh, of, of where you know of, of, of precedence and uh, you know and the evidence. And that's it. If, if there's no evidence to talk about an issue, then we can't talk about it. So that's yeah. one, one problem. The other problem is the awesome. politics of it, because now coming off as being anti-progressive, you yeah. know, it's politically suicidal. So nobody wants to come out. I, 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 and, and then you talk about the needing for the 
for the expand, expansionist camp to organize more. I agree, but the Orthodox is the more, more organized. Okay. It, is, it is the one that draws the, you know, the conventions that bring thousands upon thousands of people and, and many people identify with that. So I, I do agree that there needs to be a discourse. I'm not sure if we, the discourse is gonna happen between scholars. Mm. Um, I, think, I think the discourse has to start with activists, with community mm. leaders, with um, common people, if you will, uh, uh, who, uh, who are not activists uh, or scholars and have community forums, sort of like what we had before, it's called Let's Be Honest. Mm. Start from a grassroots conversation about these issues, and it's not just in in, in you know um, you know in these progressive circles that you talk about that Linda Sarsour is around, but it's also the Rashida Tlaibs and the Ilhan Omars um, mm. and and AOC. They're part of the progressive camp, and and there's a lot of pushback from Orthodox groups against uh, Rashida and Ilhan for taking stands that are in solidarity with LGBTQ. Yeah. And then even we, as a political organization, we get a lot of reaction uh, on that same issue. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. You're at stage and you're, you're open-minded and tolerant and all that. Yeah, and, and then also we get it from the other side. We, from the LGBT, LB, LGBTQ side that we're not uh, uh, definitive enough. We're not coming out and saying what they believe, you know, should be just very clear that we should accept uh, it as part of uh, the Islamic faith. So um, it's, it's, we've got a long ways to go. I don't see an easy solution, but I see it more coming from the grassroots than from, from the top. Yeah. I mean, Muslims are not the only religious community with that particular challenge. Right, right. exactly. And that's another thing is that, you know, have the Christians and the Jews figured it out? No, they, they, not, they have all, not all denominations of either. No, no. That's what I mean is that you may have, you know, a, a camp within each faith right. that, you know, is, 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 has taken a stand, but, but, but the orthodox of that, uh, of that group, if you will, um, um, has uh, attacked it, has, you know, feels that it has deviated from the faith. So they haven't resolved the issue is what I mean. Islam is just a little different in the sense that Islam is the only religious community in the world that had this, I mean, there's Jewish law, which is a very sophisticated legal system, but it did not spread around the world to the degree that Islamic law did. And right. so the legacy of Islamic law in huge swaths of the world is a particular unique challenge that, that is different than um, what modern Christians and Jews deal with. That is correct. So we, we have, we have a, a lot more baggage to carry <laughs> and a lot more to unpack in terms of what's happened historically and, and where it stands today. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the time, Sarah. Really enjoyed seeing you and, and hearing you. Uh, and I'm sure all of our uh, 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 attendees uh, uh, appreciated uh, what, you, what you offered in terms of your analysis and your skills your scholarly work. So really thank you. And we, we hope to have you again. Thank you so much. It was an honor, pleasure to be here. All right. Thank All you right. very much, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye.